And we're back. Um, our next speaker is uh, Arnold Brody, and he'll give us an update on the Artemis a lunar mission. Well, thank you, Paul, and hello to everyone here tonight and those watching from home in Canada and around the world. Tonight, I'd like to give you an update on the Artemis project. Tonight, we will review what Artemis is. We'll check the results of the Artemis 1 uncrewed test flight around the moon last year, take a look at the plans for Artemis 2 crewed flight uh, around the moon in uh, 20, oh, that'll be in 2024, that's right. And then we will look ahead uh, to the Artemis 3 mission. That will be the return of astronauts to the moon's surface. And then we will finish with questions facing Artemis. So what is Project Artemis? It's a mission to establish permanent human presence on the moon or in orbit around it in the Gateway Lunar Orbiter. And to achieve this goal, NASA has developed the Space Launch System rocket and contracted Lockheed Martin to design and manufacture the Orion spacecraft. The European Space Agency contributes the European Service Module, which provides solar panels for electrical power and engines for controlling Orion's orbital maneuvers. Together, these components can transport astronauts round trip between Earth and lunar orbit. NASA has contracted SpaceX and just 45 days ago, Blue Origins to develop human landing systems for transferring astronauts from the Gateway Station down to the moon and then back up again. Eventually, in a process called pre-staging, NASA and its Artemis partners, including Canada, will send assets like shelters, rovers, energy, and life support systems to help establish permanent human, a, a permanent human colony on the moon. Now, being close to home, necessities can be ferried up from Earth to keep the colony going, but the long-term objective is to develop the technologies needed to become self sustaining on the moon. We can then use what we learn and develop for colonizing Mars, which is too far for routine supply from Earth. Colonies on Mars must be self-sustaining. Many people who colonize Mars will probably stay there and produce Martians, making the human race multiplanetary. Now, I'd like to play for you a five-minute NASA video that describes NASA's vision on how Artemis will help to achieve this goal. And after the clip, we'll look at the results of Artemis 1 test flight last year. So let's roll the video. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew and heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. 
Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond. I'd like to point out a few things from that video we just watched. Pre-staging is not included in any of the currently planned Artemis missions that comes much later. The HLS does not separate when leaving the moon. If it left its legs behind, it could never land again. The entire HLS must return to lunar orbit to be reusable. The lunar gateway is not fully funded and its future is uncertain. I'll get back to this under questions facing Artemis. Now, radiation is a serious problem in space. Astronauts talk about seeing flashes with their eyes closed when going to sleep. The flashes are cosmic rays making contact with their retina, which means cosmic rays are also hitting their vital organs, muscles, and brains. Astronauts receive 400 times the radiation we get on Earth. To study this problem, two torsos from Germany, one wearing radiation protection, the other without, were on board Orion. Both wore radiation sensors to measure the effectiveness of that protective vest. 
A third dummy was a full-body, human-weight mannequin or moonikin named Campos in honor of Arturo Campos, who saved the crew of Apollo 13. The moonikin was fitted with sensors to measure radiation and the dynamics of launch to see how it may affect astronauts' ability to reach control screens. Lessons learned will help safe, help develop safe environments for people heading to the moon and Mars. Every event was a first for the SLS and Orion, starting with the launch itself on November 16, 2022. The solid rocket boosters helped get the entire system off the ground and were exhausted and jettisoned two minutes after liftoff. The SLS booster continued to fire, putting the system into orbit, then separated and fell back to the Pacific. Next, the upper stage fired to send Orion out to the moon then separated and fell back to the Pacific. Next, the upper stage fired to send Orion out to the moon, then separated from Orion. By the way, for the next Artemis II mission, Orion will use its own engines instead of the upper stage to leave Earth and go to the moon. Now, five days later, Orion reached the moon's gravity well and maneuvered into distant retrograde orbit, or DRO, on November 25, this orbit took the spacecraft farther from Earth than any previous human-rated spacecraft as it swung behind the moon. This is the image Orion took of the moon and Earth while at this farthest point. Orion took two passes around the moon before returning home, reaching its farthest from Earth on November 25, then using the second pass, um, around the moon, second pass on December the 6th, yes, like a slingshot uh, that would then send it back home. Notice how the moon traveled halfway around Earth between Orion's two loops around it. Notice also that on Orion's second pass, it makes a clockwise orbit while the moon travels counterclockwise in its orbit around Earth. And because it loops around retrograde, it almost comes to a stop, as you saw there, and then falls back down to Earth on a journey that takes about five days. Let's listen to the NASA announcers describe Orion's return. This view is from one of the solar array wing or saw cameras on board the vehicle. The vehicle now over 1,680 miles away from the moon. And that small sliver towards the bottom of your screen, that's here, that's home, that's us. And that is where Orion is headed next. A half century later, NASA's newest moon explorer, the Orion spacecraft, is barreling its way back home after circumnavigating the moon and beyond in an elliptical distant retrograde orbit now less than two hours away from splashing down in the Pacific Ocean, west of Baja, California, to complete its shakedown mission that has opened a new era of deep space exploration. We have three fully inflated main chutes. Time to splash down 90 seconds. Splash down. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Littrow to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion, back on Earth. Orion is in great shape. Stable one, just in the orientation that had been expected. Now, the next time we see an Orion spacecraft bobbing in the Pacific, there will be four astronauts, three American and one Canadian, sitting behind those windows. We'll talk about them in the Artemis II mission coming up in a couple of minutes. Now, for the first time in NASA history, a skip entry method of re-entering Earth's atmosphere was used. It reduces Orion's velocity through atmospheric drag as the capsule dives into the atmosphere briefly, then pulls up. This dim 
this dip in and out maneuver is entirely computer controlled using atmospheric data uploaded to it just before re-entry. And after the skip out in space, as the capsule re-enters the atmosphere, it's, go it's going slower than it would have otherwise. And that reduces the G-forces on the astronauts and reduces the heat on the heat shield because it's not traveling quite so fast. And the heat shield, of course, is the most valuable asset in the Artemis inventory. So what are the results of the Artemis One test flight? The space launch system was a pass. The SLS rocket performed with precision, meeting or exceeding all expectations. The solid rocket boosters and all of the lower and upper stage engines executed their ignitions, burns, throttle downs and back up, shutdowns and restarts perfectly. According to Artemis mission manager Mike Serafin, quote, the rocket systems performed as designed and as expected. In every case, performance was off by less than 0.3% in all cases across the board. How about the European service module? Did I go too far? Yes, I did. Okay. How about the service module? That was a pass. The uh, rockets uh, the module's engines operated perfectly, enabling Orion to execute the distant retrograde orbit, exit the moon's gravity five days later, and direct Orion back home. The module generated 20% more power than initial expectations and consumed 25% less power than predicted. The modules are built by the European Space Agency with most of the construction in Germany with the other European countries providing the components for it. And how about the Orion capsule itself? Well, as you saw a moment ago, that was a pass. Orion accomplished 161 objectives, objectives to fully demonstrate every aspect of the spacecraft. In fact, testing went so well, NASA decided in mid-flight to test 20 additional objectives, passing them all. The onboard systems were so successful that they were removed from the Orion capsule and are being integrated into the next Orion for Artemis II. Lockheed Martin is the producer, designed and produced uh, the Orion spacecraft. And how about that computer run skip entry technique? That was a pass. The automated onboard systems successfully uploaded atmospheric and weather data to calibrate the timing of the firing of Orion's thrusters to orient the capsule's angle of descent and pitch of its shield to execute the dip in and out of Earth's atmosphere to reduce speed before re-entering the atmosphere for splashdown. Slower speeds also improve accuracy reaching the target splash zone even if the zone is shifted as we shall see. How about that heat shield? Pass. The heat of re-entry did not penetrate the largest ever heat shield and destroy the capsule. The heat shield uses an ablative coating which is designed to gradually wear away during re-entry, taking the heat away with it. Post-flight analysis show the coating wore away unevenly. A significant amount of the original Avcoat material remained in some places. Avcoat is the name of Lockheed Martin's ablative coating that they designed for their heat shield. And uh, that final step of splashdown, how was that? Well, that was a pass. Now, bad weather at the intended splash zone in the Pacific coast uh, off of San Diego, that forced the change to a new location 550 kilometers further south off the Baja California Peninsula of Mexico. The lower speed from the re-entry technique probably helped Orion re-aim its tra uh, trajectory and the capsule splashed down within sight of the recovery ship USS Portland, coming within four kilometers of the target, beating the mission requirement accuracy of 10 kilometers. In other words, Orion stuck the landing in spite of NASA moving the goalposts, a perfect 10. This is what mission success looks like, folks.
Serafin said. Now, the overwhelming success of Artemis I, particularly its heat shield, must be an enormous relief for the crew of Artemis II, which will launch as early as November 2024. The crew of four were, were announced back on April the 3rd. They are Victor Glover, Christina Cook, Reed Wiseman, and from Canada, terribly handsome, Jeremy Hansen. Now, as you can see, Jeremy is easily the tallest and biggest of the four. Is it just me, or does he remind you, too, of Buzz Lightyear? There's a lot to like in this foursome. We have both white and colored, male and female, and the crew includes a non-American. Another reminder, along with the European service module, that Artemis is an international effort. Let's hear a few words from these astronauts. I'm Christina Cook. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Jeremy Hansen. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Victor Glover. I'm the pilot. I'm Reed Wiseman. I'm the commander for the Artemis II mission to the moon. To the moon. To the moon. To the moon. When I was young, I had a poster of the Earthrise picture, the famous picture that was taken on Apollo 8. And the fact that it was a human behind the lens that made that picture so profound and changed how we all thought of our own home was so amazing to me. The moon is not just a symbol of thinking about our place in the universe. It's not just a symbol of exploration. It's actually a beacon for science. It's a beacon for understanding where we came from. You know, pushing ourselves to explore is just core to who we are. It's a part of being a human. That's our nature. We go out there and we explore to learn about where we are, why we are, understanding the big questions about our place in the universe. The exploration we're doing is the first few steps on the path of getting humans to Mars. The Artemis campaign of missions have set such an ambitious goal for humanity that it's inspiring contributions from around the globe. Not just one nation is inspired and moved by this, but nations from around the globe are coming together. When I look at the Artemis II crew with Victor, Christina, and Jeremy, they want to go do this mission. They are keenly driven. They are humble to a fault. It is so cool to be around them. Artemis II is a huge mission, but I hope we will look back and realize that this was one tiny step in humans on Mars and a sustained presence on the moon. Before start, Artemis II will be NASA's first crewed flight test of the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft around the moon. To verify today's capabilities for humans to explore deep space and pave the way for NASA's long-term human and scientific presence on the lunar surface. We are ready. We are going to the moon for all humanity. We are Artemis. This graphic shows the path the Orion capsule will take in Artemis II and 12 key steps that occur throughout the journey from liftoff to splashdown. You'll notice that Orion will orbit Earth twice for system checks before departing in step six. Also, Orion does not orbit the moon. Instead, it loops once behind the far side of the moon, then heads right back home for splashdown in the Pacific Ocean off the U.S. coast. Now let's take a look at these 12 key steps in action. Liftoff. If no problems with launch, the abort system is jettisoned and the core stage continues firing to reach low Earth orbit. 
then separates and falls back into the Pacific. While coasting in low Earth orbit, the solar panels unfold and are positioned before the second stage fires to raise the perigee or low point of Orion's orbit. Orion will stay in Earth orbit for 42 hours to fully demonstrate and certify the capabilities of the spacecraft's environmental control and life support system that will be flying for the first time with the crew of four astronauts. Half an orbit later, the second stage fires again, raising Orion's speed and boosting the apogee or high point of its orbit in the direction towards the moon. The second stage separates from Orion and the two orbits side by side. Pilot Victor Glover will manually control the service module's engines to demonstrate Orion's ability to navigate precisely towards and away from the second stage and adjust the craft's orientation with it. That's imitating docking maneuvers. The service module has 42 small thrusters grouped into six pods that can fire individually or in tandem to move or rotate the spacecraft to any position. The maneuvering capability is needed for docking with the human landing system in Artemis III. So it's important to test this function and learn how to operate it. Now, following the test, the ESM's eight auxiliary engines fire to add more speed to Orion and raise the apogee even higher like winding up a slingshot for a shot at the moon. During this final orbit, all remaining system checkouts are performed. The crew must complete their assessment of life support, exercise, and habitation equipment to ensure readiness before heading to the moon. If Orion receives a clean, a clean bill of health, the module's main engine will fire, sending Orion on its way. By the way, the main engine has flown to space before. It's a repurposed space shuttle orbital maneuvering engine, which can swivel in pitch and yaw. The trip to the moon takes four days. During this time, the crew will continue with exercising and testing all of Orion's life support equipment and navigating systems. They will also have time to enjoy the view of a reseeding earth and a growing moon, and I can catch a quick sip of water. If all, if all course corrections are spot on, Orion will swing around the moon 7,500 kilometers above the moon's leading side in its orbit around Earth. That's a retrograde orbit sending Orion around the back of the moon in a direction opposite the moon's direction around Earth. And this causes gravitational breaking on Orion as it swings around to the other side of the moon and is flung in the direction of Earth. The Artemis crew are now on a four-day trip back home. They will continue with the same tests as before and possibly more that mission planners could add on if all is going well. The crew will also have chores preparing for re-entry as they watch Earth growing ever larger. Now, before entering Earth's atmosphere, the European space module will separate from Orion, and then it will fall back to Earth, landing in the Pacific. Some pieces may hit the water. Meanwhile, Orion performs the skip entry descent in which the astronauts experience up to four Gs of deceleration twice. And now, we're coming in before the atmosphere and parachutes together will slow Orion down to 35 kilometers an hour or 20 miles an hour for those of you on the Imperial system. And then it will splash down in the Pacific. Step 12, the last step of that journey. The U.S. Navy with NASA teammates then recover the astronauts and the Orion capsule. If all goes well, we're on to Artemis III, which will see two Americans, male and female, 
land near the moon's south pole. This mission introduces a new component, the lunar gateway that would already be in orbit around the moon before Artemis III launches. It also includes a second spacecraft called the Human Landing System, needed to take the astronauts down to the moon and back up again, since Orion can't do that. Only after an uncrewed starship docks with a gateway, only then would NASA send the Orion capsule with a crew of four astronauts up to the gateway to also dock with it. The crew would transfer to the gateway. A day or so later, two of them would enter the HLS to descend to the moon's south pole for a week-long stay before returning to the gateway for a ride back home in their Orion. NASA announced their choice of SpaceX to develop a version of its starship to serve as the human landing system. They made that announcement in this video. NASA has chosen SpaceX to return us to the moon. I am so excited to partner with SpaceX in this fantastic endeavor for the Artemis suite of missions. So congratulations to the SpaceX team. The SpaceX design is a single stage solution using their Starship. It provides extensive volume for the crew with two airlocks and ample down mass capability. The SpaceX proposal included in space propellant transfer demonstration and uncrewed test landing. So now that we've selected our partner and for the next phase going forward, we have to make sure that the testing occurs because we're not gonna launch humans until we have a successful test. So we will be working to make sure that uh, the design and everything that we have going forward so far is ready to go. So the human landing system is going to allow us to be able to access different parts of the lunar surface. But it also allows us to explore a new technology and capabilities that will help us when we are trying to figure out our next round of technologies to be able to help us land on Mars. Landing on Mars is a strong suggestion as to why NASA picked the SpaceX design. Elon Musk is developing the Starship for travel to and landing on Mars. So by funding its development as the lander for the moon, NASA's managers, managers are simultaneously getting their Mars lander developed. But NASA is now planning to get down to the moon without the Lunar Gateway Station in Artemis III. In this Wikipedia explanation, the Starship will rendezvous, in other words, dock with the Orion capsule, and the two moonbound astronauts would transfer directly into the Starship for their trip down to the surface and back. There would be no gateway. It could be constructed later, and if it is, Canada will have an important role. We are to provide Canada Arm 3 to help with the station's construction and securing incoming vessels. It should be noted that the Starship HLS spacecraft will use up its fuel just reaching Earth orbit and will need to be refueled before heading off to the moon. SpaceX will need to put a fuel depot in Earth orbit, then launch a number of Starship tankers to fill the depot with propellants. And only then would the Starship HLS launch, dock with the depot and take on the fuel needed to reach lunar orbit and then ferry astronauts arriving on Orion down to the moon and back up again. And it could do that multiple times with a full tank. All of this draws our attention to the development of the SpaceX Starship system. Now, last April, many of us watched the SpaceX attempt their first orbital launch of a Starship stacked on top of its booster stage that's powered by 33 Raptor engines. Now, the test uh, Starship failed to separate from the booster and the whole system was purposely detonated three or four minutes after launch while over the Gulf of Mexico. Clearing the launch tower was the only achievement. So pressure is on and SpaceX will need to make significant progress quickly 
in order to pull off an automated uncrewed landing of a starship up on the moon and return to lunar orbit before Artemis III can launch. Now, two months ago, NASA selected Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin Aerospace Company to provide a second human landing system known as the Blue Moon HLS. It is to be the moon lander and return to lunar orbit spacecraft used in Artemis V, and that's planned for 2029. Blue Horizon's New Glenn heavy launch vehicle is currently under development, and that's what will propel this HLS up into lunar orbit. Now, there are interesting questions facing Artemis, such as, is there a need for the Lunar Gateway at all? Doug Cook, former NASA Associate Administrator, said NASA can significantly increase speed, simplicity, and cost, and probability of mission success by deferring gateway and reduce, reducing critical mission operations. George Abbey, former director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, the gateway is, in essence, building a space station to orbit a natural space station, namely the moon. If we're going to go return to the moon, we should go directly there, not build a stati stati <laughs> space station to orbit it. René Wachlavisek, on designing the gateway, he noted that there was difficulty in designing comfortable living quarters. He was forced to shrink the module's diameter to just 1.2 meters. That, that's because of the limited weight that we can currently launch into lunar orbit. Most of the habitat's eight cubic meters of available space will be filled with with um, support equipment, and that leaves a total of only 1.5 cubic meters of space, personal space, to be shared by four astronauts. Robert Zerbin, president of the Mars Society, calls the Gateway a dangerous experiment exposing humans and equipment to high doses of cosmic radiation outside of low Earth orbit for the dubious scientific purpose of figuring out how to endure it on long duration space flight. That would amount to unethical medical research. He says it's like shooting your own soldiers to study wound pathology. Rene dismisses the gateway as NASA's latest jobs program, a boondoggle of sorts for longtime aerospace partners. He calls it a lunar orbit toll booth. And Another question, is there even a need for the SLS and Orion? By using the existing International Space Station as a transfer hub, instead of building one to orbit the moon, NASA could send its moon-bound astronauts up there aboard a Crew Dragon, like we do now for ISS crews. Space, SpaceX launches the Starship HLS. It is refueled and docks at the ISS. The moon-bound astronauts transfer to the Starship. The Starship takes the astronauts to the moon and lands there. After they complete their exploration, the Starship returns the astronauts to the ISS, where they transfer back to the Dragon for the return to Earth, uh, with the uh, capsule closed, I would imagine. Then it's a simple case of repeat. Because the components are largely reusable, including the Falcon 9 rocket used for launching the Dragon, sending more astronauts to the moon it is a simple, low-cost repeat. And this eliminates the cost of single-use space launch systems, the Orion capsules, and the Lunar Gateway. When will Starship fly? As we saw, Artemis depends on the Starship HLS to take astronauts down to the moon. And Artemis 3 is currently scheduled for launch in December 2025, according to their website, which is only 30 months from now. SpaceX must, must complete an autonomous landing of a Starship on the moon's surface and relaunch to lunar orbit before Artemis 3 can launch. The first orbital test flight of Starship and Booster back in April failed. 
The second attempt is planned for next month. There will be a lot riding on this second attempt. SpaceX also needs to develop the depot and tanker variants of the Starship, the technology to transfer propellants in Earth orbit, and demonstrate their ability to catch returning spacecraft with the launch tower chopsticks in order to quickly relaunch those tankers and their boosters. Can SpaceX accomplish all of this in 30 months? Probably not. And Artemis 3 is likely to slide into 2026. Many website sources already say 2026. If Artemis stalls while waiting for Starship, a lack of launch cadence leads to a loss of talent. Some may be assigned to other projects or laid off. Some may pursue opportunities elsewhere. There will be hiccups getting new people trained and up to speed. With significant turnover comes increased risks. If Artemis stalls, there could be public skepticism, a drop of interest, maybe questions regarding NASA's vision or leadership. And that brings with it a risk of losing congressional funding, especially if an anti-science Congress gets selected as well as losing international support if partners abandon Artemis to take on other projects. So what have we learned? Well, Artemis 1 was a big success. Artemis 2, with four astronauts on board, including Canadian Jeremy Hansen, will loop around the moon, currently planned for November of 2024. Artemis will land a man and woman on the moon, planned for December 25, with a starship from SpaceX serving as the lander. There will not be a gateway involved at this time. And as we saw, the project depends on Starship. And we also saw a number of questions facing the Artemis, such as why the lunar gateway? And we also saw the difficulty Starship is having getting its act, getting its ship off of the Earth. In summary, as we celebrate the success of Artemis 1, and as we look forward to Artemis 2 crewed mission flight around the moon in November next year, we must also keep in mind that there are significant questions facing Artemis that can lead to rethinking the missions or at least significant delays going forward. And that's all I've got for tonight. Are there any questions? This presentation, Arnold, that was really, really good. Appreciate it. Very good. Uh, questions in the room. Here we go, Frank. So uh, a quick question regarding the um, Artemis 1 Orion spacecraft uh, heat shield ablation, which you pointed out was um, uh, ablated unevenly. So do you have any more information to share about that? For example, I, was it um, expected to or, un or not expected to ablate unevenly? Um, I, I, I checked to see, is that really a problem and could not find any conclusive uh, dialogue about that. The only conclusion I can come up with is if it wore away Unevenly, there was more left than they expected. I gather that's a good thing, that it didn't wear away too much. If I were going to be writing in Artemis II, I want that ablative coating not to wear away altogether. So if it wears away less rapidly than predicted, then it's probably pretty good. That would be my take, but I couldn't find def definitive uh, discussion about that. Okay, any more questions in the room? Online. I could, oh, by the way, I could add one more tidbit. Uh, in that video we saw towards the beginning, it, they said the SLS is the most powerful rocket ever. Well, that was until that test flight back in April of, of Starship. Uh, this, uh, the booster with its 33 Raptor engines generates not quite twice, let's say 75% more thrust than the SLS. 
Okay, so uh, there's a question right on the other side. Um, how did they select the, the landing location on the moon? They wanted to go to the South Pole so they could take a look at the uh, permanent water ice that is in the permanently shadowed craters of the South Pole. They want to get down there uh, and maybe grab some samples. I don't know if they're bringing anything back, but at least get down there and study the location um, because that's where it's more than likely that a, a Mars colony will be built because you need that water uh, for self-sustaining environment and also for rocket fuel. So the South Pole is most interesting. Oh, I should also add that the Chinese said they're going to go to the moon and have a colony as well. They want to get there by 2030. And there's a rare uh, mineral on the moon that is a thousand times more prevalent than it is found on Earth. And it's a, a form, I forget the name of the uh, chemical, but it's used in fusion technology. So there's keen interest in going to the moon for those resources. So there's a race on now, now with China. It was against the Soviet Union back in the 1960s, 70s. Now the race is with China. So that, are there plans to go to other locations in the future? There could be. I mean, once they have the technology in orbit to go up and down, they mentioned in one of those videos that the one of the advantages of the uh, Lunar Gateway is that it can drop people off at any location around the moon. The same is true if you have a starship serving as the orbital gateway. It could be doing the same distant uh, orbit or the same um, re rectilinear orbit, they call it SRO. Uh, I forget the name of that orbit, but the spacecraft, the Orion, uh, the, the, the Starship could imitate what the Lunar Gateway would have been doing. So it could also drop off astronauts anywhere they want to on the moon. So if there's an interest in let's explore this area for its minerals, that's maybe up at the equator or at the north end of the pole, they can do it. That's one of the advantages of this orbit is that it gives you a shot at any part of the moon that you may want to go to. The keen interest now is the South Pole, but I'm sure they're want, they're want to land elsewhere. Any more questions? Yes, Frank. Well, it was a great presentation, just like the other two earlier this evening. And so just as a suggestion, rather than a question, it would be great if you could uh, put together a, a presentation about the Chinese lunar uh, lunar um, uh, project in the future. I'll take that on as a challenge. Can you find such information? Maybe. <laughs> it might be a short presentation, Frank. I don't know. All right. Any other questions? We're good? All right. So thanks again, Arnold. Maybe from the uh, chat window? No, no questions. No questions. No okay. questions there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks again, Erna.